Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, happy to join you all uh, this day. Uh, this is the first event of Pen Law FinTech Club. This is an initiative of uh, Pen Law uh, alumni. Uh, we decided to form this group uh, last year in order to discuss uh, different legal and regulatory issues. Uh, related to the intersection of financial technology law and regulatory aspects of, uh, of the currently days. Uh, with uh, this first event, uh, we decided to brought some uh, uh, people across the, the industry from different uh, background. Um, and we, we are happy to have them today with us. Uh, a couple of, of uh, reminders before starting the the introductions. Uh, for those who intend to get CLE credit, uh, myself and my co-moderator, uh, fellow, fellow friend Miguel, will be, um, will be telling the, the passcode for the CLE accreditation during the event. It will be uh, two different ones during the event. Um, and the Q&A, please submit your questions uh, on the Q&A button on the top of the top of our screen, and we will, uh, uh, myself and, and uh, Miguel and I will look into that and try to incorporate that during the during the panel. Okay. Uh, taking to that, I'd like to to introduce some of our our of our of our fellow friends and, and panelists that are here today. Uh, Amos Garrity uh, is a partner at QED Investors. QED is one of the most famous, perhaps the fam famous uh, FinTech fund worldwide. Um, he has been uh, in this field for more than five years from now, I believe, and we're working and looking into different uh, investment opportunities across the globe and in the US. Um, we also have uh, Simon, Simon Katz, Simon Katz is uh, also a graduate from Penn. He did his LLM program and graduated in 2015. Uh, when he came back to Panama, he decided uh, to, to found Adelantos, which is a FinTech credit uh, that uh, gives credit, grant credits to, to individuals. Uh, he's going to explain a little bit more about his, his uh, FinTech enterprise during the panel. Uh, he's his co-founder and CFO of this company. And also Mr. Bruno Mayor of Salama. He's a Brazilian, uh, as I am originally. He's a professor at uh, lecturer at UC Berkeley Law and also a senior global fellow of FGV Scholar in Sao Paulo. Uh, now I, I'll pass, uh, I'll pass the, uh, I'd like also to introduce uh, Miguel Armas. He's the, he's the, is the co-president of Wharton FinTech. is a brilliant and awesome initiative that the Wharton students do in the FinTech landscape. Uh, he has been uh, hosting the Wharton FinTech, uh, Wharton FinTech podcast for two years now. And he is also the co-founder of Gagamash Ventures. It's an early stage FinTech, uh, early stage VC venture capital fund focus on FinTech in Latin America, in the Americas, actually. Um, please, Miguel, I welcome you and all the other panelists. Um, please, uh, and for you to introduce also Sarah uh, Hammer here in the panel. Yeah, th thank you, Joao. Yeah, very, very glad to also introduce uh, Professor Sarah Hammer, who uh, is the managing director of the Stevens Center for innovation and finance amongst the many, many hats that she wears. And for those of you that don't know, the, the Stevens Center is, is really uh, a jewel that we have within, within Penn and Wharton, which is leading uh, research, education, and, and thought leadership uh, within FinTech, um, which also includes blockchain and, and crypto, right? Um, and Sarah, wears many hats. She's a professor at Wharton. She's an adjunct professor of law at the law school, right? And she's also she also sits on different boards outside of Penn. 
Um, last thing I'll say is that the Stevens Center is a great supporter of Wharton FinTech. Uh, the podcast would not be possible without their support. And you know, we're always grateful to have a friend like Sarah. Thank you so much, Miguel. It's my <laughs> pleasure. And, and, and with that, maybe um, we, you know, we have a lot of topics to cover. And we thought we can get started by talking about the investment landscape um, in the region, uh, specifically, obviously, for, for fintech, right? And I guess here we can, we can start by, by maybe uh, Amaya's. Maybe you can, can tell us a little bit. I mean, QED has, has been focused on fintech for, for a while now, close to 15 years, if I'm not mistaken. But Latin America came in your, into your radar through an investment in Nubank. Um, however, that wasn't your last investment, right? You, you've continued uh, to, to pay a lot of attention to the region. So, you know, maybe, maybe talk to us, you know, why did you decide as a firm to double down on the region while obviously continuing to, to focus in, in the U.S.? So, um, look, I think there's, there's, there's two pieces of advice that um, are, are really important uh, when you're an investor. Um, both are kind of hard to take. Um, so one is if you're going to do a great deal, make it your first one. So Nubank is, is us following that advice accidentally. Another one is sort of better lucky than good. Um, <laughs> So, you know, David Velez um, knew Nigel because after Nigel, who's the head of QED, um, left Capital One, where he was a co-founder, he spent some time sort of as an operating partner at General Atlantic, and David had, was an associate at General Atlantic. And when David started Nubank, he called Nigel and said, Nigel, you've got to invest. And Nigel said, we don't really do investments in Brazil. And David said, just please, you know, please come along the journey. And so Nigel said, okay, David, this will be fun. And uh, obviously that turned out to have been a very, very good choice. Um, so the other thing that happens there, and, and again, sort of once you've, uh, once you've done an investment in a company like Nubank, people start coming to you and they say, well, oh, these are the guys behind Nubank. Must be that they really know what they're doing in LATAM FinTech. Um, and so we, we have really been the, the beneficiaries of a lot of luck um, and a lot of really good relationships. So we work very closely with Kazek, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, they invest a little bit earlier than us and a little bit more broadly than us. And so we've really been the beneficiaries of others who have who've invited us along for the ride. Um, now, as we've uh, done more and more, we, we've become, you know, at least some, uh, at least some sense expert on our own. And we now have a, a team of um, two partners and a principal who do nothing but uh, LATAM. Um, and so we really have uh, spent, you know, more and more time there. I think for us, the, the big reason why Latin America is so exciting um, is that in, in Latin America, you, you have some really big trends that make fintech uh, very attractive. And one of the things that we often try to identify, although we're not excellent at it, is, is there a mega trend here that is even bigger than the, the fintech trend that we can see? So for example, you might think like, oh, digital payments is a trend, but really digital payments is a subsidiary of a mega trend, which is e-commerce. And so the, the, what we've seen in the rise of fintech payment companies is in many sense, uh, just a tailwind from, from e-commerce and the rise of e-commerce. And so LATAM being a little bit further behind there, but it gives us an opportunity. Another thing that's happening in Latin America, which is not happening in the US, is increasing formalization of the economy. And I think those of us who live in the more developed world can easily see that Oh, well, developing, you know, moving from more cash based, um, more piecemeal work to formal employment. This is good. It's good for countries. It's good for GDP. But one thing it's bad for actually is liquidity. So if you work in the informal economy, it's cash on the barrel head. Um, so, you know, you work a day, you get paid a day. If you move into a formalized sector, uh, it could be two weeks. It could be a month. And so 
there are trends like this are, that, that really create really uh, rich openings for, for fintech, which is uh, you know, financial services, naturally, the, the manipulation of money through time and risk. And um, so those, those are some of the things that, that we are on the lookout for. But honestly, we've been extremely lucky uh, to have the exposure that we have. And uh, we're pretty deep in the, in the ecosystem now. So it's, it's frankly easier for us um, to find great fintech deals than it might be for someone else uh, coming into because we, we just have such a great referenceable network and um, CEOs uh, like David at Newbank and Sergio Creditas and David at um, Confio. And you know, CEOs are the source of pipeline because w people who want to be a fintech CEO go to you know, sit at the knee of um, successful fintech CEOs. And so we get to be the beneficiaries of, of that network. Yeah, mo most of them former guests of the podcast, by the way. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and Simon, so from your point of view, right, you, you're, uh, you're building a company. You aren't at the stage where, where Newbank is that has raised a ton of money, but it is a conversation you've had and I understand you've had to raise some money. How has this, you know, progressed over time, particularly your relationship with funds, outside of, of uh, Panama, which is, I understand, where, where you are. Yes. Uh, so I think uh, Latin America has, it's, it's in a boom. It's a, very, it's a very good stage to be right now. I think being a founder in FinTech in Latin America, you are at a really good stage. I remember when we started Adelantos in 2016, we started in Panama. Right now, we expanded to Peru and Colombia, and we, we keep growing. And I remember when we were having our first conversation, regardless of fundraising, we, 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 had, we, we had an MVP, we had a product, was getting some traction, and we decided that, okay, now we need, we need the money, right? And I remember in 2017, probably being a company in Panama, a, where it's a small country, not necessarily have like all the, all the funds taking a look at you. A, however... I think right now uh, the situation has changed. People understand that Latin America, uh, there's so much need for more that it's basically an ideal setting for companies to scale. And it's not, and, and one of the cool things that, that I feel that as a, as a founder we're doing in Latin America is that you're not, you're not like developing product that makes life just easier to people. You're like basically giving fundamental things to people like in the u.s you have credit it's probably it's it's for granted you have credit you have good credit or bad credit and in this informal economies you have people who have been working for 30 years but for some reason they're not part of the credit system so so i feel like it's it's much easier now to be a founder in latam because people like like nigel for example in qed or other funds they know that latam have so much potential that they're willing to, to go through the regulatory struggle, I would say, that is working in LATAM uh, because uh, cool things happen down here. Yeah, the, the famous Harry Stebbings, who hosts the 20 Minute VC, just last week started hosting Latin American founders. And last night he tweeted that, uh, you know, in Latin America, you're investing in products that make life 90% better for 99% of the population. But in Western markets, you're investing in products that make life 10% better for 5% of the population. Of course, you know, he's exaggerating a little bit. Uh, but but Amai, you also invest in the U.S., right? Um, how about the, the situation in, in the U.S.? I mean, some, some argue that valuations are, are heating up and some of them might, might be a bit too high. Well, it's, um, you know, one of the things that we tell ourselves on valuations is, you um, you know, you, you, can't rely, you can't trust your back book as evidence of your skill um, in this market. So ordinarily you invest in companies that are worth, you know, a lot of money and people say, oh, you must be good at your job. But in this, in this market, um, it, we, we have to sort of be constantly running that self-doubt framework. Um, so so that, that's, that's the first thing I'd say about valuations. And then also it's just true that um, we both, uh, harvest in the sense that when, you know, the SPAC boom makes it, you know, a number of our companies are going to exit. The IPO markets are going to mean that a number of our companies going to IPO. Many of them have already filed um, or, or are preparing to do so. But then it also means that deploying capital 
um, is uh, is a little crazier than it than it used to be. So you know, not so many years ago, um, I remember uh, one of my companies raising a Series B, um, which was sort of twenty million dollars on eighty million valuation, and nowadays, um, and they had five million dollars in revenue, and nowadays that would be you know, a series A with less than $1 million in value in, in, in revenue. So it's, it, it's gotten a little crazy for companies that are hot. I think it's still just as hard as it ever has been um, for the average company, but for, for companies that, that get into an auction dynamic where there's some amount of conviction that, that builds up, um, it can, the, the, the prices can get really, um, can, can get really high really fast. And this is just, you know, it's just option value um, because one of the things about being a venture investor, it's not like public markets where uh, the price reflects everything. So in public markets, in order to win as an investor, you need to be contrarian, which means you have to get, get something at a low price and you need to be right. So you need to be willing to pay a higher price than everybody else and you actually need to be right. To be honest, in, in, in venture investing, you don't need to be contrarian. You just need to be in the deal. So... If you are right, it doesn't matter if everyone else thinks you're right, as long as you get in the deal. And um, there are, it's very scarce who, who gets to have ownership stakes in these companies in the early stages. And if you're right, the early stage uh, price will be, you know, orders of magnitude lower than the late stage price. And so this is what drives early stage prices up because it, there is this idea that if you are right, it doesn't matter what price you pay. So, so that's sort of, you know, something about the US market, I think it's true generally, um, any company that is sort of definitionally global and actually, you know, be interested to hear how Simon is thinking about this, like, you know, coming from Panama, you've got to be thinking globally earlier than a US company has to think global, you know, very late in its life cycle, a company like Simon's will have to think globally, um, very early in its life cycle. And then I think you do have, um, you know, one of the things I've been spending a lot of time on is just this natural evolution from human machine interfaces to machine to machine interfaces. And so uh, working with Nate Sofio also at Wharton, uh, I've, I've been publishing a series of probably overly involved essays on APIs as the future of software. Um, and, and what does that mean? And so it also reflects my investment practice, which is more focused on the picks and shovels, the tools, um, the software layers that, that enable others to build um, so that I think that some of those will be giant companies, but many of them will be smaller companies that serve smaller audiences, but, um, it will be easier to build. And so maybe the economics will still work. So th those are some of the things that, that worth spending a lot of time thinking about. Yeah. Uh, Simon, anything you, you'd like to add here? No, I was, uh, I, I totally agree. I think, uh, technology right now, it makes, uh, makes the conversation of being global, it really uh, uh, makes it a possibility, right? It's, it's very nice to think, yeah, I want to I wanna conquer the world, I want to be global. It, having APIs in place, having all, all, all sort of things, it's definitely a game changer for companies like us that you can basically go to market in a very, in a very efficient, very efficient way. And I would, and I would say that uh, it's good to, to see that there's, there's the backing in place for, for making all, all these dreams uh, come true as a as a founder, right? So, so no, I, I'm I'm excited to to be working in this space. I think one important thing is, and, and being a law school panel, the regular like the regulatory burden of crossing countries. It's also uh, I think there's an entire panel for this only, but it's it's really in the U.S. You work uh, probably you are like one yeah you have different states or in Europe you have I would say more formal or or laws play along better when you start jumping from a country you start Panama Brazil Colombia Mexico it's an entire world down there people say yeah Latin America but yeah th this is an entire world by by itself each small country it's a different rule a different rule set right so. So uh, as we expand, it's also uh, one one key thing to to keep in mind as companies grow that that's it's not only getting your product right, but the regulatory burden and bureaucracy it's also part of the game. Yeah, I think that's a perfect segue, right? Um, I'll, I'll I'll give it to Joao to introduce the next topic, but here is where I'm supposed to share the class code 
spring, like the, the, uh, sorry, I just got something like the, our current season. That's the class code that I have. <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's the CLE. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks very much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you. So moving forward, if the, another new topic here we have today, and it's the first event of Bangalore FinTech Club. Um, would like to talk a little bit of uh, Professor Sarah Hammer uh, regarding the payment and uh, the payment um, infrastructure and payment uh, market here in the US. Um, and Sarah, we have seen um, a tremendous amount of, uh, of growth uh, when it comes to digital payments, right? Um, in the last decades, uh, besides the, the, the the old giants, let's say Mastercard and all those credit card companies, and we have uh, companies uh, we call fin we still call fintech such as Stripe and and PayPal working around like one hundred million dollars and and three hundred billion dollars and three hundred billion respectively, and uh, I don't know um, what do you see uh, the reasons of this growth uh, recently uh, in in the US and like worldwide. Thanks, Joao. I, and if I can digress just for a second, I'm, I'm going to get to your question, but I wanted to just touch on uh, what Amias and wow. Miguel and Simon were saying, uh, because I don't want to lose the opportunity um, to make, a, I guess, a plug for the Stevens Center and our work at Penn Law, but also to really touch on the great work that um, the three of them are doing. And what I wanted to touch on was what Amias was mentioning about his um, thought leadership on APIs and some of the companies that he's worked with. Um, and for our audience who are watching from both Wharton and Penn Law, we've had the great opportunity at the Stevens Center to work with Miguel and others from the FinTech Club on um, group independent study projects where we consult for some of the companies that, for example, Amias is working with. And um, through that, I just wanted to reiterate that we've really had a great opportunity to learn a lot about these companies and to dig into some of these issues, including some of the regulatory issues that Simon mentioned. Um, so if we have folks from the Penn Law community who are watching, who are interested in being involved in that or from the Wharton community um, who haven't yet been involved but would like to, we would more than welcome your involvement. I think it's a great opportunity both for alumni and for students on the business and the regulatory side. And a great way to learn about some of these companies, as Miguel mentioned, is through his podcast, uh, which um, is one of the world's leading podcasts on pin, FinTech. And we're very proud of him and the club for, for producing that. So, so uh, that's my little digression, but I, I wanted to mention that before I get back to your um, question, Joao, about payments, which, um, you know, as, as Amias mentioned earlier, is a, an interesting and exciting area of fintech. And I happen to be a financial infrastructure um, nerd of sorts. So I'm fascinated with the payment rails in the US and globally and our clearing and settlement systems. And for folks who are interested in what's really propelling growth, not only in fintech, but in commerce generally, it's a really interesting area. And as you mentioned, Joao, we've seen incredible valuations. Uh, we just had reports recently, you know, that Stripe was valued at $95 billion. It's now the largest unlisted firm in the United States. Um, PayPal is valued at about $280 billion. So that would make it larger than Wells Fargo or Citibank, which is pretty phenomenal if you think about it. Um, and PayPal shares have traded at 68 times earnings. If, even if you take a company like Square, for example, which most of us are familiar with, um, we've seen shares trade at as high as 510 times earnings. So there's really an incredible amount of growth in this space. And as Amias mentioned, there's the trend of growth in payments, and then there's a larger trend of growth in e-commerce. And I would actually break that down further and say there's the growth of e-commerce that has been promulgated by the pandemic as well as a pre-pandemic move away from brick and mortar shops. And then on top of that, an increase in market share within the online payments companies. So overall, what we're seeing not only in the US but globally is just an increase in the number of digital transactions 
and a decrease in the number of, for example, check and cash transactions. Um, so that, that clears the way for a lot of these companies to expand. And um, when we think about the kinds of companies that are out there, they really run the gamut from, you know, we all use probably Venmo and PayPal and Zelle, which is an, uh, a consortium of banks that facilitates payments. And then there are payment companies that work not only with retail, but also with small businesses um, like Square and Stripe, for example. And then in addition to that, there's like a whole universe of digital wallets like Apple Pay or Google Pay, for example. So it's really an exciting area. Um, and I haven't even mentioned super apps, which I think um, our, our global investors on this panel will know a lot more about those than I do, but I really think it's an exciting area for a lot of folks. Yeah, that's, that's such an interesting times for that business as well. Uh, well, uh, at the same time, we uh, at the same time um, uh, we we understand there has been some some issues with the existing payment infrastructure in the US, right? As we uh, actually were talking about that before the, the when we were planning for this event, right? And I was uh, I thought it was really interesting to share with uh, the entire panel and. We'll, and the, and the community who is, who is here with us uh, in this afternoon. Uh, so, um, and, and as we are also talking about, um, perhaps because it came later on, uh, other countries uh, such as, for example, China, they created uh, technology for, for example, the QR code and other, other, other type of, they, they switch, they escape from credit cards, they escape from the, the old traditional checks and they, started like using platforms as we chat and et cetera. So they don't have the entire legacy we have, probably US has today. So how do you see this? And, and how do you think like uh, the US, I mean, the, the, the financial industry is facing this type of or addressing this type of issue nowadays? Yeah, that's a great question, Joel. And uh, it's timely, you know, there was some, attention paid to our payment infrastructure in the last couple of months uh, when we had an outage at the Fed in their payment system. And even around issues like operational risk in payments, um, there was news of a $900 million payment that Citibank had made that um, was litigated because of a human error. So we, we are definitely in a different place in the US in our payments infrastructure. And one thing I think is interesting for folks who may not be as familiar with the infrastructure and with the regulatory structure is that our payment system is has a couple of different layers. So if you and I do a Venmo, for example, there's a whole layer to that that we don't see. We might interface with our Venmo app and that sends the instructions to, um, to our bank to make a payment. And then the bank has to actually send a message to the recipient's bank. And that occurs through what's known as a clearing service. And then the payment between the two of us is actually not completed until a third part of the transaction occurs. And that's called the settlement. So there's the retail interaction with the payments app, and then there's the interbank interaction which some refer to as the wholesale part of the system, but the retail part where you and I might Venmo with each other can't occur without the interbank system. So at the heart of it, really our issue in the US is the speed of our payments. And the two levels I mentioned are two levels of really thinking about where that speed matters. There's the speed of payments to an individual, and then there's the speed of payments between banks. And we certainly have opportunity for improvement in the speed of our payment system. Um, we have a system in the US where the Fed operates some systems, both in clearing and settlement and competes with, but also regulates the private sector portion of clearing and settlement systems, like for example, um, the clearinghouse interbank payment system. And so we have a ways to go before we get to a real-time payment system where payments are quicker in the US. And this matters for a lot of reasons. It, it matters for um, interbank transactions. It matters 
for individuals who may be waiting for a payment, and it matters for financial inclusion. Um, I know that Amias at QED has been working with some other companies in different parts of the world who have different systems where their payment systems are faster. And, uh, you know, here in the U.S., the Fed has suggested a movement to a real-time payment system um, that they would manage, but that wouldn't be implemented until 2023 or 2024. So um, we have, we definitely have uh, opportunity for um, acceleration here in the U.S., and it'll be interesting to see how we can help, you know, help push that forward. I should mention um, there's a whole other side to this, uh, not to complicate matters, but there's a whole other um, area of interest around crypto and uh, cryptocurrency payments and what may be the advantages or disadvantages of a cryptocurrency payment network and whether it could scale to accommodate the speed necessary to um, facilitate all of the kinds of digital transactions that take place in the US. Um, but it's definitely an exciting emerging area. Um, last year, the OCC permitted banks in the US, national banks to make payments with stable coins. So we will see um, a growth in this space and uh, it's definitely an interesting area. Uh, well, that, yes, such as, I didn't know about the stable coin issues, but such as uh, interesting, I'll, I'll check that out later on. Um, but uh, one thing that, because uh, in my mind, like is um, the importance of uh, payments uh, in financial inclusion, right? Uh, that certainly, um, Set, you're certainly right with respect to that. And, but uh, I think the audience would like to hear more about that, uh, Sarah. Uh, so um, uh, how do you see that? I mean, if you give more like, uh, if you give like, I mean, we are seeing kind of that here in Brazil for instant and payment system, mm -hmm. right? It was uh, implemented on, on, on late, middle to late uh, November. Uh, the, the rate, the, the rate, got really decreased for the individual to individual transactions. And now I think it, the total volume of transaction already passed another type of transaction uh, between like uh, bank transactions uh, generally. So mm -hmm. an amount of, of money being transacted. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you see like the financial inclusion being uh, empowered by, by digital payments or digital transactions and more instantly? Right. It's, it's a great question, Joao. And I, it's something, financial inclusion is something that I'm very passionate about. And, and I know you and others at Penn um, and elsewhere are as well. And it's definitely something I think we need to keep top of mind as we think about what the best way is to move our financial infrastructure forward. Um, because on the one hand, while we want to increase innovation in technology, we have to bear in mind that there's a whole group of folks out there who are unbanked and who rely on cash and maybe even don't have access to the internet or a mobile device. So um, while there might be a lot of new payment options, they are linked to bank accounts or they require internet logins, it could be a disadvantage for folks who aren't connected to that network. And in many ways, a lot of the companies and capabilities that we've talked about here today are really reliant on what the particular infrastructure might be on the country that they live in. Is there internet access? Do they have mobile phones? Are folks using cash or not? Um, there are some parts of the world where there aren't banks or there aren't as many banks. Um, and in those parts of the world, in fact, we've seen FinTech play a really important role stepping in where folks can be given a mobile phone and they're able to then um, conduct commerce or make payments or what have you. And we've seen FinTech play an important financial inclusion role. Um, but it, I just I feel it's something we need to keep in mind as we think about what the right technology is and um, what the existing parameters are. You know, here in Philadelphia, where Penn is, there was actually a law passed in the last couple of years that requires all stores to continue to accept cash. And the reason for that was that 
um, many stores were moving to digital only payments. And you can see what the advantage of that might be. Um, it could be faster, it could be easier. You know, in the age of COVID, some might consider it safer because you don't have to handle cash. But the law was passed because there are so many folks who only deal in cash. And so we don't want to exclude those people from participating in the digital economy as it moves forward. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Oh, definitely can make it. Um, and as you are aware, like perhaps the, the 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 other topic that we have here today that you can you are for, uh, completely free to jump into uh, Professor Salama's uh, presentation. He's going to, to to give us now. It's about central bank digital currency. We somehow it's they are uh, linked to to payments, right? Because uh, if you go digital with with the with coins, perhaps you can change the way the, the money transfers from hand, one hand to the other. But um, uh, I'll leave to, to, to Professor Salema to explain better because it's, it's also like a, perhaps a confusing topic for most of us, right? Uh, how we can switch from like a fiat currency to like crypto and then like to a fiat, to a crypto that comes from like also there's the state on, uh, working on it. So it's kind of like, different for us to like get where we are going, where we're heading to, right? So, but before that, I have the other announcement to make, uh, the other password for those who want to get the famous Shelly credits, uh, the password is future. Uh, so, and there's also another, there's a, an, an answer for me here. So I'm closing that. So, and without further more question, I, Appreciate a lot, uh, uh, Professor Sarah's uh, enthusiasm with uh, this such amazing topic, and and introduce uh, Professor Salema with such an interesting topic as well as well. With his all in all news and everywhere, uh, a lot of like new projects popping up every day in different countries. But to be honest, several different news, but nobody knows where we're heading to. So please, Bruno, if you can. And Professor Bruno, if you can please uh, help us with that, with this intro, at least as we into this topic, it will be very helpful for all of us today. Thank you, João. Uh, pleasure to be here. I want to start with a story. It happened almost 60 years ago, and uh, it still gets uh, talked about today. And you may or may not have heard of it. In uh, 1953, President Eisenhower appointed a man named Charles Wilson to be his Secretary of Defense. And Wilson was then president of General Motors. And he decided to retain his uh, General Motors stocks. So in his confirmation hearings, someone asked him, uh, Mr. Wilson, are you in a position to take a decision that would be bad for General Motors? And he gave, he, he gave an answer that became legendary. He said he wasn't that concerned because what's good for General Motors is good for America. Now, I see a parallel between the auto industry back then and the banking industry since the 80s. I think everyone has become, uh, 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 everyone has come to believe that what's good for the banking industry is good for America. However, I think that's changing. And in part, this is changing as a political reaction to the uh, 2008 debacle. Uh, banks uh, indeed screwed up and people are still upset. But there's a lot more. Banks do three things. They lend, thus they are engaged in intermediation. They make payment, we call that plumbing and they create money. And so their power and prestige stems from the fact that they do three things that are so important. They intermediate, they do the plumbing, and they create money. But technology and politics and many other things are changing that. Uh, and, and, and the way to make sense of that is to realize that these three functions are being disentangled 
from one another. So commercial banks will not disappear. They'll not become irrelevant, uh, but their heydays are gone. And importantly, for the present discussion, this is good news for fintechs. To understand what's going on with banks, we would have to tell three interconnected stories. I tell them to my students sometimes, but here I don't have enough time. Uh, we would have to tell, it's not even a story, it's a history. We would have to tell the history of the evolution of lending then the history of the evolution of payments. And by the way, Amy has just uh, had an, a, a nice framing, a nice insight for that when he said that um, the, the evolution of payments is in the headwinds uh, of changes in e-commerce. And that's, a, that's an interesting point. But in any case, the third story, which is the one I'll focus on, is the history of the evolution of money creation. In all of the stories, the role of traditional banks is decreasing. So let me try uh, to summarize the most important within those three stories, uh, which is the history of the digitalization of money. And it clearly ex explains, I hope, uh, why the role of banks in money creation is going down. And again, why this is good news for fintech. As I see it, there are four stages in the digitalization of money. The first is the era of digital account balances, digital bank deposits. With computers and the internet, almost all of the money becomes digital. And what is the nature of this money in digital form? Most of it is private money. But private money, of what kind exactly? Private money uh, in terms of bank deposits, deposits, that is current account balances. Uh, we forget that bank deposits are money, but they're not the same thing. Um, and the money uh, that is issued by the banks when they make loans performs all the classic functions of currency. It's a value of storage, so you can save in your bank account. It's a unit of account because it's denominated in dollars, and so it allows you to establish the relative values of things. And it's a means of payment, very importantly. Uh, now, bank deposits, uh, they're money, but they don't have legal tender. It doesn't have legal tender. So theoretically, someone could reject payment with a current account balance and request, say, physical cash instead. But for obvious reasons, nobody does that. And so in practice, digital bank account balances, that is digital bank deposit, uh, deposits, are just as good as money. So let's, let's not get lost then. Uh, the first stage in the history of digitalization of money is this period where almost all of the money, so to speak, feels digital and is created by banks. And at the same time, physical cash, which is the money created by the government, is only used for small purchases, if at all, and very importantly, for illegal activities. What's the second stage? The second stage is an intermediary stage between the digital bank deposits and central bank digital currencies. It's exactly where we're now. It's a, a time of transition. And in this era, there, there are a few things happening. The first is the resurgence of other types of private money beyond bank account money. And many of these new types of money are created because of a new technology, cryptography. And their moneyness, the moneyness of this uh, new assets, they can come from different, th different things. So if you take Bitcoin, for example, is the cri cryptographic security associated with uh, uh, a stock limit. Uh, then if you take, let's say, digital gold, it's linking with another asset. There's, there's the stable coins, which is the convertibility into bank money and so on and so forth. Um, 
Now, this types of, of private money can be very speculative, but increasingly they're becoming central to the payment systems. And so Sarah was just now talking about, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, you were talking about, uh, you, you were saying the valuation of, it just escapes me, the valuation of, uh, right? Sorry? Right. Stripe. Stripe. Yeah, is, is uh, higher than the valuation of uh, the stocks from the banks, right? Oh, pay so, PayPal. PayPal is so larger than PayPal. University. Yeah, so PayPal is the example right. I have in mind. It just escaped me. Um, uh, and so other types of electronic money are, say, uh, WeChat and LAP in China and M-Pesa in places in Africa and so on. But the government is sometimes using electronic money to improve payments as well. And there are many examples. So there's PIX in Brazil. If you have any doubts about it, you should, uh, you should ask João, right? But there are many other countries doing similar things, the UK, Australia, Nigeria, and many others. And the United States is doing that as well. And it's gonna be called Fed now, and it's created to support real-time digital payments nationally. But it's still not the new stage, which is the creation of CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. The European Central Bank says it's going to launch CBDCs in 2025. China is already doling out some CBDCs through lotteries uh, just to see how it goes. Uh, the US is, for understandable reasons, taking its time and hasn't announced any plans for creating uh, CBDCs but it's gonna come. So what's a CBDC? Well, it's not simply electronic money. It has two very important traits, or maybe we should say three. One is it's issued by the government, um, but it's, the second is it's not convertible into anything else like say stable coins. And finally, and this is the crucial characteristic of a CBDC, it's digital, fiat currency. It's the real deal. It's cash. It's an obligation of the central bank and therefore it's M0, just like bank reserves, just like cash. But very importantly, maybe this is the fourth characteristic, right? Since it's the real deal, since it's like cash, then it's legal tender. So it's exactly the same as paper money um, but it's in digital form. Are we there already, right? As I said, mostly we're not, but there's one exception and that's the Bahamas. The, the Central Bank of the Bahamas has issued a CBDC and that's a huge change from the perspective of money creation because the issuance of CBDCs prevents bank, uh, banks from creating new money. In the Bahamas, it works like this. For every token the commercial bank issues, they call it the sand dollar, the bank, the commercial bank must have one Bahamian dollar deposited with the central bank of the Bahamas. So in other words, it's the end of fractionary reserves. It's the end of private bank money creation. It means private banks will do payments and lending, but will create less money. In simple words, what's happening here is a devolution of monetary powers to the government. And this is a very dangerous business and I've written a short paper about that precisely to highlight, highlight the risks. But that's not yet the end of the story or the history because there's a fourth and last stage. As soon as the CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies are out, Current uh, countries will start playing with smart CBDCs, programmable CBDCs. And then central bank currencies acquire new functions. Smart CBDCs do more than uh, storing value uh, and serving as unit of account and serving uh, as means of payment. They become programmable networks uh, for verifiable commerce. You go to the bakery and you pay with a CBDC, the sales contract is automatically closed, but that's very tricky. 
because governments can do a lot of things with smart CBDCs. They can monitor people. And so that's why so many, so many folks are so worried about privacy with CBDC, but they can do other tricks. For example, they can determine that the CBDC will expire after let's say one year or two years if they want to make people spend more money or they can create, uh, uh, they can sort of tax your CBDC or create a negative interest rate and so on and so forth. So let me conclude, let me say this, you open the newspaper and everybody's talking about Bitcoin and, and Facebook's uh, Libra or, or DM now and ICOs, et cetera. And this is all a tale of private money challenging public money. But CBDCs will greatly empower governments. And that reminds us that the future might bring more not less government and public money. But here's the deal for those interested in FinTech. Whether new money will be public through CBDCs or private through Bitcoin or what have you, it's bad news for the incumbents, the commercial banks, and it's good news for the entrants, the FinTechs. Thank you. Joe, I think you're, you're muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. It was really nice, Professor, Sim, Professor Bruno, really nice that you brought some ideas, fresh new ideas to the, to the audience, right? To the, uh, so any comments uh, from the other panelists about uh, Bruno's, Bruno's uh, new, new ideas, new fresh ideas? Well, I, I like, I, I really want to draw out the irony that the, the idea of decentralization and blockchain and permissionless stores of value has now uh, led many of the same people to be excited about a central bank digital currency, which is um, where the immutability property gives uh, perfect visibility to government and law enforcement. So um, I find that irony fun. I don't know where it'll go out, but uh, I think that that irony is fun. And then the other comment I would just make, I think people, um, appreciate this is that central bank digital currencies are not fundamentally technological questions. They're fundamentally political questions about whether, as Bruno just laid out, um, money will be publicly provisioned or privately provisioned when it is dealt with at scale. And today, um, money is publicly provisioned at small scale. That's what our physical notes are and privately provisioned at large scale. And I think the implications of that public-private divide are actually much more significant than the implications of the, as I would say, the mere choices on database architecture as to whether it is um, a decentralized database architecture or a different data database architecture for tracking the question of public and private money. So I think Bruno did a really nice job of highlighting this as a fundamental issue of public versus private provisioning rather than fundamentally a technological challenge. And it's I, I, really, I was going to really not that, that techy. Sorry, the Bahamian Central Bank does not use crypto. It does. Right. Sorry, it does not use. Uh, it does mm. not use uh, blockchain uh, for its uh, CBDC. Exactly. I was. I was going to say. I, I fully agree with that, what Amias just said. And uh, since you know, this is obviously a very complex topic, like all the topics we've talked about today. I hope the FinTech Club and others at Penn have the opportunity to take it up again on another event. But uh, as Amias mentioned, a CBDC can be a blockchain-based system, or it can simply be a, more of a traditional database system. And even within blockchain, um, the prototypes, if you will, many of the, most of the prototypes, if not all of them that are out there, um, if they are on blockchain, are permissioned blockchains. So there's different iterations of what the organization and the technology can look like. And that's two different things. The organization, whether or not a central bank would maintain a ledger of all transactions, including wholesale and retail, or an organization where there are intermediaries 
that maintain the ledger for retail payments. So there's a lot to explore here. And I think um, it's definitely ripe for further discussion by this group and others at Penn, but I'm, I'm glad we're having the chance to hear from experts like Bruno and, and all of us on this. Well, that's, that's the idea of this first event, uh, the idea of having, of opening another, another platform for, for the Penn community and other, other um, stakeholders uh, that would like to discuss those type of topics, right? So, um, um, uh, unfortunately, it's just one hour, but uh, it's, I, believe, I believe it's a beginning of a new path for all of us here. Um, so, uh, I would like to, to, to thank all of you uh, Amiles, um, Simon, um, Professor uh, Sarah, and Professor Bruno, Miguel, who actually had to, to, to leave the, uh, for another <clears throat> event he had. But I really appreciate having you all here for this uh, launching event and hope to see you again soon on, the, on another great afternoon, just as we had here today. Okay. Thank you very much. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.